Please welcome to the stage the director of the Institute of Behavioral Science, Lori Hunter. Good afternoon, everybody. Wow. So great to have you all here. Thanks for spending the afternoon with us. What an amazing day it's been. So it is my honor to introduce this panel to tell you a little bit about the Institute of Behavioral Science. They just said that I was the director and also to introduce our fantastic moderator today. So first, um, a summary of the panel itself. Climate change, as we know, is often driven by the actions of people and policies of countries that are economically and politically advantaged. However, climate change disproportionately impacts the human rights of economically disadvantaged individuals. These might include indigenous peoples, migrants, women, children, older adults, persons with disabilities, and others. Climate change also disproportionately impacts those living in island nations, in the Arctic, and other areas that pose high risk. This panel explores the specific human rights impacts of climate change from the perspective of these groups of people. So, I forgot to say the title of the panel. I just summarized it without the title. The experiences of those whose human rights are disproportionately impacted by climate change. So thanks you all, thank you all for being here. So the session's theme is very much linked to the mission of the Institute of Behavioral Science, which they mentioned I am I have the honor of being director of. I'd like to mention a couple of connections to the content of this panel today. So first, the Institute is the interdisciplinary hub of science on the CU Boulder campus. We have political scientists, econo economic <laughs> economists, sociologists, um, anthropologists, political scientists, all working together to grapple with issues around society's most important problems. And of course, the justice aspects of climate change are a really important part of that research agenda. So we're really happy to be part of this today. I'll offer a couple of examples. The first is our Natural Hazard Center. I see our esteemed director, Lori Peek, here today. The Natural Hazard Center is the global clearinghouse, the premier clearinghouse for research on the social dimensions of natural hazards and disasters. They bring together researchers and practitioners to generate really important knowledge and then to apply that knowledge in the pursuit of a more just society. So we're very honored to have Lori and the Natural Hazards Repre Center represented here to get today. Um, their emphasis obviously perfectly aligns with the panel. So we also have scholars that examine rural livelihoods in South Africa, in Brazil, in Mexico, in Tanzania. I see Professor Mara Goldman here who does work in Tanzania. Um, and in that work, we emphasize the ways in which climate change impacts the livelihoods of particularly vulnerable communities and households. Um, we look at the way that impacts, uh, excuse me, livelihoods and the ways in which they make their living and meet daily needs. Some of my own research is along those lines in rural South Africa. So in the Institute, we have others that examine natural resource governance and the impacts of different forms of governance on human well-being and health. We also have others who examine climate as related to ancient peoples in the American Southwest and think really carefully about the ways in which archaeological research can shed light on the challenges of environment and society in contemporary times. All in all, I hope you see that there's a lot of connections and the Institute of Behavioral Science is very proud to be part of this summit, so thank you for the invitation. I see John here, who also offered the invitation, so thank you, John. So now it's my honor to introduce our moderator, Lakshmi Singh. Lakshmi Singh has spent the last 30 years collaborating with some of the most talented producers, editors, photojournalists, and engineers in the industry to deliver thousands of historically significant stories as an anchor, as a news magazine host, as a field reporter and an audio documentary producer when she covered stories in Central America and the Caribbean. My guess is that many of us have heard some of those thousands of stories. So she recently spent time in the field researching the impact of climate change on indigenous communities in Belize. 
Sing an anchors the Midday for NPR newscasts, which is one of the top three most downloaded podcasts in the United States. NPR newscasts are also the most heard content on public radio, reaching more than 24 million listeners weekly through traditional radio listening. That's extraordinary, the impact, so impressive. Um, Singh has invested decades advocating for stronger representation of women and of people of color in newsrooms across the country. And she's trained and mentored new generations of journalists. Her efforts are underscored by recognition from a variety of respected education and research organizations, including the Asian American Asian Research Institute and the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center. Singh is a graduate of Syracuse University's SI Newhouse School of Public Communications, as well as their College of Arts and Sciences, where her work focused on Latin American studies, Spanish, and broadcast journalism. So it is my absolute distinct honor, and I hope that you will join me in welcoming Lakshmi Singh to Boulder, Colorado for the UN Climate Summit. Can't believe I'm here. Can't believe I got to hang out with this fine group. Thank you so much for the kind invitation. Thank you, Dr. Hunter. And thank you, everyone, for allowing me to be part of this experience. On my journey getting to know and learn from people who have been called to climate action, I met a young father and conservation activist who recalled hitting a crossroads and choosing a less travel path that led him back to his indigenous roots. Cue the package. The guttural sounds of howler monkeys echo from the forest surrounding Elio Rash's village in southern Belize's Toledo district, home to many Maya catching. Elio makes his way through a cluster of small trees bearing cacao. It's a major export for Belize, historically exalted by ancient Maya as a gift from the gods. But a changing environment affects the fate of the cacao and many other crops. Elio reflects on the uncertainties of farming, then compares it with the life he led years earlier in Taipei. He says, ironically, the modern conveniences and financial security he dreamed about and finally acquired could not give him the one thing he missed, peace. We have fresh air. We're beside a river where you can jump into the river if you want. It's not polluted. To eat, I can go right to the river and fish. But holding on to some semblance of tranquility now is often tested. Heavier than usual rainfall or longer than usual heat waves take their toll on crops. Elio and other young Maya who traded in urban living for a return to rural surroundings, in part because of the pandemic, are adapting to the harsh realities of a changing climate. And as Elio explains, they're doing so through the very conservation practices already rooted in Maya tradition. When we harvest corn, we're harvesting corn on a need basis, on a food basis, on a, on a family basis. We're not planting corn to, on a commercial basis. We only take what we need. For Monica Koch Magnuson, who is based in Belize and has spent decades on the front lines advocating for the rights of indigenous peoples, Elio's story signals a long-awaited change. I've seen young people changing. Now it's like a paradigm shift that's happening, which is exciting because it's like young people coming back and recognizing that there's beauty in our way of life. The Belizean government has long declared its commitment to the protection of indigenous rights, as it also forges ahead with conservation initiatives some critics say come at the expense of the very people whose ancient traditions are rooted in sustainability. 
Magnuson says that will be a central issue for her and other Indigenous rights groups at the upcoming COP15 in Montreal, where 195 countries will begin to focus on finalizing a global deal that shapes the future of and shareholder stakes in the planet's biodiversity. My colleague Trina Williams and so many of my colleagues who've made climate coverage a top priority at National Public Radio, thank you all for being part of this important conversation about the experiences of those whose human rights are disproportionately affected by climate change. So now in alphabetical order, I'd like to introduce some of the panelists whose work and contributions have been vital in defending the rights of individuals and communities and are here to share personally what they have been experiencing on the front lines. First, Nahala Haidar. She's one of the vice chairpersons of the UN Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. Haidar has also been elected as a commissioner of the International Commission of Jurists. Haidar has over 30 years of professional experience mainly within the United Nations system in various capacities at headquarters and in the field, ranging from social development and humanitarian assistance to peace building and human rights. She holds an LLM in law from Pantheon Sorbonne, Paris, and a law degree in international law from St. Joseph University in Beirut, Lebanon, as well as a license in sociology. Welcome, Nahala. <laughs> Selena Leem is a climate warrior and a poet from the Marshall Islands, crediting her late grandfather for her deep awareness of the fate of her home. She has made it her mission to globally raise awareness of the climate crisis. Representing the Marshall Islands at the age of 18, Liam was the youngest delegate of the 2015 UN Climate Change Conference in Paris, alongside then Marshall Islands Foreign Minister, they delivered the closing statement for their country. Leem went on to many other global stages to speak on behalf of her people using storytelling and spoken word. Most recently, Leem was a speaker at the 2021 TED Countdown Summit. Welcome, Selena. We also have here today Hilda Flavia Nakabuye a Ugandan climate, gender, and environmental rights activist who founded Fridays for Future Uganda, a youth-led and organized global climate strike movement. Every Friday, she works toward building a safer and healthier environment by rallying governments, corporate organizations, and communities to take climate action. The Future Girl Rising Fellow has represented her continent and frontline communities at international conferences and events, including COP25 Climate Change Conference, C40 World Mayors Summit, and the Women's March for Climate in London, among others. Welcome, Hilda Flavia. <laughs> and I would also <clears throat> like to introduce uh, someone who has joined us virtually. His name is uh, Matthias Aren uh, Sami, an indigenous reindeer herding community in northern Sweden, representing the Sami people. He holds Master of Law degrees from Stockholm University and the University of Chicago, and a PhD from the Arctic University of Norway, where he is a former professor and presently a visiting law professor. He has written extensively on Sami and indigenous rights, including indigenous people status in the international legal system. And Arun has acted as counsel to Sami indigenous reindeer herding communities in proceedings before domestic courts and international judicial institutions. Welcome, Matthias. So in case you're wondering why at times I'm going to be looking down at this phone, it's because uh, we might have some questions coming in from the audience that's texted to me. So please don't think I'm not paying attention to my fellow panelists. I really am. Um, now, we've all heard Elio's story about what personally moved him to action, Elio Rush, um, who decided to leave um, a lucrative career behind and return home to Belize um, to help his people and to help the country um, survive the future threats, the ongoing threats and future threats of climate change. 
spoke a great deal about what moved him. So I wanted to take this opportunity to find out a little bit more from all of you about a personal experience uh, or a moment that personally moved you um, toward a, a path of uh, climate change work, work against climate change, and work in defense of human rights. And I wanted to start with Selena. Could you tell us a little bit about what inspired you to pursue this path? Yes. Thank you, Lakshmi. Yawai Olive. Hello, everybody. My name is Selena Lam, and I am from the Marshall Islands. And for those of us who don't know where the Marshall Islands is, we are located halfway between Hawaii and Australia. And we are a large ocean nation comprising of 34 islands and atolls. And that's about 72,000 people, approximately, is our total population. So that's even smaller than the population here in Boulder. And at most, our country is two meters above sea level. And so growing up in the Marshall Islands, you really, it's not a choice that you have to be involved or be aware of the climate crisis, except growing up, um, being coming from a country that is really religious, Christianity mostly, um, having to explain everything that was happening around us, the changes that my elders were telling me about, did we turn to the Bible to explain? And then that would be, oh, the, the world is coming to an end. And it was only when I moved to a boarding school where the school's focus is on sustainability, that's where I came to learn about the science of the climate crisis. And so growing up um, with our seawall being two meters above the sea, and during uh, king tide season, so this is when the tides are at their highest, my entire island, Mijuro, where I'm from, especially we call Demon Town, that's where I was uh, brought up, it would be flooded. And so you would see the, the waves come all the way from the ocean side and wash over into the lagoon side. And my grandfather, he had told me, reprimanding me because I was misbehaving. And again, we are a Christian country and he wanted me to be a good child and live in heaven with God. So he told me, if you don't fix your attitude, um, God will melt the ice in the North and South Pole and will flood the entire Marshall Islands. And so that was a very rude awakening to what was happening around me. I don't know if he knew that that was what was going to happen or it is already happening. Um, but as a young child, uh, my mind went into places that were very terrifying. And so I, the next year, whenever it was summertime, I would think, oh, it feels hotter this year than it was last year. And then when the floods would come again, I would think the waves are even higher and they're happening more frequently. And at a, a time where my government and my people is not able to, um, to combat. And so with that new sense of awareness to my surrounding and the environment, and having to see my grandfather push my grandmother and myself and my siblings to go into a hotel in the inner parts of the island that would still get flooded anyways. Um, and he would stay behind at the house to protect it. And I would cry and think, oh my goodness, if we leave now, what are the chances that I'm gonna come back and meet my house and my grandfather the next day? And so it was this deep sense of needing to protect the ones I loved in my home, in my backyard, that allowed me and enabled me to become a climate warrior that I am today and um, take spaces in these platforms that have been enabled for people from the frontline communities to come and share their stories. Hilda Flavia, you also shared a very compelling story about your family's uh, livelihood in farming having been affected can you tell us more about that? What moved you? Why that story? Why that experience moved you on the path that you're currently on in climate action? I come from a farmer's village in the basin of Lake Victoria in Uganda. Growing up as a child, we had a very big plantation in our village and we used often to send food to the towns. but. After some time, my family experienced diverse effects of climate change. The seasons started changing. 
the yields from the garden started reducing. We experienced heat waves, droughts, heavy rains, strong winds that destroyed our farm. Our farm. And as time went on, we lacked food uh, because we couldn't get enough from our garden. And my grandmother had to sell off part of our land so that she could get money to sustain our lives. And when the land was almost over and we were left with just a small piece where our house was, she couldn't sell any more land. And by the time we had to buy food from the town, which wasn't the case before, and my my father had to find other means of um, sustaining us. So he moved from the farming business into the construction business so as to earn some money for us. And I remember missing several months out of school because my parents couldn't afford my tuition fees. When other kids were going to school, I was home. And I remember that we the meals at home started to reduce from five meals a day to two to one until we just had to wait for water from the stream. Meanwhile, the stream was also drying up. And at that time, I didn't understand what my family was going through, but I remember my grandmother in her room crying and asking the gods what was happening to us, why the gods were punishing us. As a child, I didn't know more about the gods, but I believed her because she said so. And I asked her, grandmother, why are the gods punishing us? And I kept asking this myself. Gods should be understanding. If we haven't done anything wrong, why would they punish us? And it wasn't clear for me until I joined university and I learned about climate change. Mm. So at university, there was this discussion about youth and climate change that was organized by a local non-government organization. And the speaker kept uh, talking about climate change, the effects, its causes, why it's happening, how he gave various examples. And I felt very connected because in a way he was telling my story when he was sharing the effects of climate change, I had him speak to me and I could relate to every bit of it. And what came to me is that many people, the people who know about climate change are not willing to spread the information they have or to take concrete actions to fight this disaster. And him saying that very little is being done for to combat climate change, it came up to me. So at that moment, I thought to myself that since I am aware of the climate crisis, I have the responsibility to spread this information to other people so that they also, they don't have to pass through the same experience I passed through growing up. And that is where my responsibility uh, started. I started to spread climate awareness with my fellows, starting from uh, my fellow classmates and my friends at school. And then we started going to the streets, spreading climate awareness, visiting schools, talking to children about climate change. And it was so overwhelming because very few people knew about climate change. This is not a topic that is taught in schools in Uganda. And until now, we are finding it a very big challenge spreading climate awareness because it's not something uh, that is previously known by the people. So in our work, we realized that women are disproportionately affected and yet they are not aware of these uh, challenges of climate change. So we started having different projects with different communities to make sure that women are involved into climate action spaces. And ever since then, we have been including women, girls, children into all the work we do because we know that uh, they bear the biggest responsibility in combating climate change. Let me interject then and bring Nahla in because this is her area. 
Um, and she's done phenomenal work. She continues to do phenomenal work in defense of women um, and, and girls women and children in this area. Can you take it from here uh, as you talk about your experiencing in the defense of women and girls? Um, and also as you're doing that, maybe think back to an experience that moved you especially um, as you were pursuing your climate justice work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lakshmi, and greetings to all of you. It's really a privilege to be here and be also in the presence of a former colleague uh, the, who has done a lot on the indigenous people's right, and I want to salute him in particular, and also to build on what this morning panel, all the intervention and the importance of this, of this uh, summit. It is indeed um, uh, mind-boggling to think about women's rights and human rights in general when you don't understand what setbacks these rights. And in fact, in working within the Committee of the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, which is one of those 10 committees that manages the implementation of a treaty that is extremely important and which unfortunately the United States did not ratify yet. I am calling also the audience here to insist on the ratification of this treaty. I think it is extremely important for women in the United States to have this international legal framework to protect their rights. Uh, we have witnessed a lot in our dialogue with the state party NGOs, women from the field coming and telling us how their rights were set back because a cyclone hit an island. First of all, you don't understand the linkages. And then how much violence increased, domestic violence including in those contexts. And then you start to see the linkage because they tell you that they are the one who fetch the water. They are the one who go and bring the wood. They are the one who take the risk. This is where the dropout of school happens for girls. And then you start seeing the gender dimension. Before that, we used to say, well, it's like Sisyphus. Every time we move right in the right direction, then there is a setback. But then we, the committee started to understand that this setback is not haphazard. It is really something that is structured and that is progressing gradually, and that disaster risk reduction is not handled the same way in all countries. An understanding of the climate and the human-induced human disaster, in fact, because climate change is a human-induced phenomena. We have abused our planet, and we are now having to pay the brunt. So all of these witnesses that came also brought me back, as you said, Lakshmi, to a personal experience I had years back when I was working in disaster mitigation and, and humanitarian affairs, where I was surveying a region in, the, in Madagascar where a cyclone had hit the coastal area, and the trees were cut like if you had cut them with a machine and flooding in the sea, and all the houses were under mud and water, and obviously these are very poor, poor villages, and uh, this is where, again, I want to reemphasize that a natural hazard can happen and does not create a disaster. It becomes a disaster when it hits a vulnerable condition. And this is what we have to address with the climate change. If it hits a vulnerable condition, a vulnerable structure, vulnerable community, it becomes a disaster. And that's why, again, the disproportionate impact, as was mentioned also by Flavia, on women and girls in particular, is real and on disabled person and on indigenous people because they are already suffering from pre-existing inequality, historic discrimination. So that's why we, we feel that these are particularly the groups that, that pay the brunt of, of the, the fact that we are not addressing in a proactive manner this, uh, in, uh, the climate change adaptation, that we are not including women in the decision making. I have given you an illustration earlier that even Japan, a very advanced nation, after Fukushima, it was revealed in the evaluation they did that women will continue to be marginalized in the response, in the preparedness. So we, we don't seem to be learning lessons. And this is quite important in this, in this uh, summit that we start really this time to think differently about the inclusiveness, about having, uh, I was very happy to hear Sheila Koti earlier, because now I think with the work also of James, indigenous 
people are part of the process. It had, there is an acknowledgement. And we in the committee have just produced another general recommendation specifically on indigenous women and girls. So we have to capitalize on, on what we have and to move away, as was said in the morning, from this silo approach and also to see women are not only victims. It's true they are still the victims, but they are not victims because they are vulnerable by nature. They are victims because of pre-existing inequalities, because of uh, it, it is it is a construed socially and economically and culturally. This vulnerability is constructed because they don't have power enough. They are not, don't have access to resources. And this was illustrated in the two uh, témoignages that we heard from the two colleagues that women do not have access to these same tools. So we have to do the paradigm shift, as was said earlier, in this direction as well. It's half of humanity, and they are many very resourceful, and they have enormous traditional knowledge. And all of this was said, so I'm not preaching the convinced, <laughs> but let's do something actionable out of this summit to take it with us. Thank you. Thank you, Nala. Nala referenced um, uh, something we've been hearing uh, repeatedly, uh, and that is the need for expanded, stronger protections um, for the rights of indigenous peoples, and that um, there's a need to take it further. I was hoping we could do a deeper dive on the impact of climate change in the respective communities, the communities that each of you represent. Um, Matias, can you uh, join us now and talk a little bit more um, about that, about, about um, first of all, uh, speak to what moved you uh, to actually uh, do more uh, in, in the way of, of climate action and get more involved in human rights, especially in the rights of the Sami people, and, and expand further into how um, the impact of climate change has disproportionately affected uh, the community that you represent. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation to participate in this uh, highly distinguished panel. I'm really, really sorry I cannot join you, Mr. Cleva. We'll do the best of the circumstances as they are. I don't know if it was or what kind of caused me to be interested in, in climate change on this kind of work, but I remember when you posed this question quite some years ago when I participated in in the moving of our reindeer herd from the winter pasture lands to, to the uh, spring pasture lands and the calving lands. And when we re you pass a ridge at the end of it, and then you let the reindeer go and that year's moving is over. And my cousin, who's very close to me, turned to me and said, can you remember, what our, or can you think of our grandfather and family before him, when they came here and they let the reindeer go, they would, be very relieved and they would know that now they would survive one more year because the winter is really the most critical time of year for summer in the herds. And it's not that long ago that that a winter could really, really kill you and your family. Something went terribly wrong. And when you had done the, the migration from the winter lands, then you would be having some part of the year with, with easier conditions and so on. But for me, the way into the work with the climate change, not climate change as such, but it was that more human rights, as you mentioned, and, and the, the, see how the intrusions and destruction of our pasture lands uh, increasingly destroys them and causing a, a, a threat to our way of life, traditional way of life, and in the end, and the very existence. And then climate change became just one of these intrusions and the fight against climate change, one of these intrusions that I was working with on, on a longer list, but of course, with the impacts that it have today, it was on top of that list. And I will use my, my, my community for, as an illustration with these remarks, but I believe that what I'm saying is reflective still of other Ranger Hardy's community also, on a broader level, also uh, indigenous peoples in general. And so just a little bit about the Sami, for those who are not familiar, with us. We are then indigenous to Northern Europe, and although we have other traditional livelihoods, we are a reindeer herding people uh, made up of reindeer herding communities. And my own community, this traditional reindeer grazing lands, they stretch from uh, Norway, the mountainous area, and 
Norway in the western part of Sweden in the west, and then to the forested areas in close to the Baltic Sea in the east. And the distance between these are about 400 kilometers or close to 250 miles. And between the winter and summer pasture lands, you have spring and, and autumn lands and also other kinds of land. And all of these make up an integral part of the rain the hardening cycle, and you need them all, uh, including what is called reserve pasture areas, which might only be used three or four times over a century, but are critical that particular winter when all, land, all other lands due to icing conditions and so on are not usable. And you need that particular land that particular year because as I indicated, it takes only one winter to wipe out an entire winter. The climate change crisis, it hits the Sami, rain the herding community and other indigenous peoples following centuries of colonization. And innate in, in that is what is a colonizer's conviction that you can put the lands of an indigenous people to better use than the indigenous people itself, which in turn is an outspring and a conviction that the colonizer way of life is superior to that of the indigenous people. But nature in its original form is not a natural resource. Nature becomes a resource only when viewed through the eyes of a particular culture or people. A part of nature might be a resource to one people, but not to one to another. When Salome looked upon a land area, we might see the natural, the natural resource rain the pasture, whereas another people see the resource timber or minerals. And international law does not allow that one people act as if it's understanding what constitutes a natural resource have greater weight than another's. But what nonetheless happened to us and to other indigenous peoples is that colonizing peoples decided that its understanding what is nature and, that, and what in nature are resources is right and our understanding is wrong. In turn, legitimizing the transformation of our natural resource, bringing the pasture into deforested areas, mines, infrastructure, water power plants, cities, etc. So this first wave of colonization destroyed a substantial number of it, my and other summer rain gardening communities, pasture lands and migration routes. Still, some rain has been smart, very resilient and capacity to adopt to new circumstances. So all of these intrusions caused considerable harm. They did not constitute a detrimental threat to the ranger husband. Matthias, can I ask you a question real quick? Um, I'm, you know, there are a number of people who would want to know what is the immediate threat the Sami people face now from climate change? Yes, what do we need to yes. know right today um, about the immediate threat to the Sami people? Yes, I was exactly coming to that. Thank you. My apologies. <laughs> no, no, no problem. Because now it comes the effect of climate change on Sami rain the herding became becoming tangible on top of what you have said. And these impacts are many, but I will stick to the, 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 the most obvious. Because cold winters and snowy grounds are not a bother to the reindeer. It can dig through the ground and find pasture and feed on it. And then and even if there's a meter or so of snow, but warmer winters though, results in temperature fluctuating up and below zero. And this can create icing layers on the pasture, which is very hard or even impossible for the reindeer to penetrate. And past, pasture lands that become subject to icing as this become unusable that winter, at least for part of the winter. And hence, due to climate change, the reindeer herding community has increasingly fewer pasture land at its disposal every winter. And those winter lands that are still there, still accessible, they are increase, increasingly stable and they offer increasingly poorer pasture. And this reduces the reindeer condition. It can cause its death through starvation or through incapacity to escape or fend off predators. Also, reindeer cows in poor conditions do not carry the calves until the calving season in the spring. So these and other impacts of climate change when the pursuing traditional summer reindeer are increasingly difficult. With fewer pasture lands available, the number of reindeer herds must be reduced forcing some reindeer herders out of the traditional way of life they have inherited from their forefathers and had intended to pass on to the next generation. 
for those remaining surviving on Ranger Hardy is becoming more and more challenging. But alarming as this development is, more, a more imminent threat to Sami Ranger husbandry than climate change itself might be the fight against it. And for the Sami and other indigenous people, this is critical to understand. Yes, climate change is terrible to us. It causes the very, very much harm. But the fight against it is even a more imminent threat as it is now. Because until recently, I'm very convinced of the superiority of its way of viewing and using natural resources. The colonizer has slowly come to realize that these uses have downsides. But this realization has not caused it to reconsider whether its view on what constitutes natural resources take precedent over ours, nor to question its colonizing practices. On the contrary, the response has been a second way of colonization, this time for the purposes of maintaining the way of life the colonizer established through the first way. Reindeer pasture lands are now consumed due to so-called green fossil free energy, lithium mines, and above all, wind power plant farms. My community alone hosts more than 10 power plants established or planned with a total number of windmills exceeding a thousand. And this is more than the entire number in most European countries in my community alone. Together, climate change and the fight against it place summer in the heart has been at the verge of extinction. It cannot afford to lose more land should it not be pushed, pushed beyond the threshold where it can no longer adopt it to survive. So as mentioned, summer in the husband has proven extremely resilient. For centuries, prophecies that we are doomed to wither away have been wrong. An ancient way of life where reindeer herding communities migrate with the reindeer hundreds of kilometers each year still exist side by side with otherwise highly industrialized and infrastructurized societies. It's quite remarkable if you think about it. Matthias, can I, can I break in there for a moment? Because I just wanted to uh, get some reaction from members of the panelists, from yes. the, someone uh, on this panel um, to this. Because one of the things that I think about is he's describing the challenges that the Sami people are. are have to face, uh, it me immediately takes me to um, a data uh, that I saw published by the World Bank um, sort of repeatedly, which was about migration. And I, I have to admit, it stopped me in my tracks when I read this. And it said something like, um, the data showing more than 200 million people is projected, about 260 million people projected to migrate within their own countries by the year 2050. But as soon as 2030, eight years away, in hot spots of internal migration. Nahla, can you please speak to that a little bit more? Because you've seen a lot yes. along this line. Yes, thank you very much. And Natalie. thank you, Matthias. And thank we'll you, Matthias. Indeed, the issue, um, this is where the intersectionality of the impact of climate change comes. If you are a woman and you're a migrant, whether they qualify you as economic migrant or whatever, you are pushing for your life. You want to uh, move to an area where you can raise your family. And, and so this global migration that we have witnessed in the past few years, climate change is a lot responsible of it, not only conflict. It's true that what the media brings us is essentially migration triggered by conflict. But even conflict is triggered by, by climate change. So it's much more complex. And we should not underestimate the impact. And this figure of the World Bank is probably underestimation uh, still. So we need to continue to look at the, the, the impact of climate change and on the intersectionality of the impact being, uh, I would say, from my perspective, a woman disabled from indigenous origin living in a conflict region, having to migrate uh, with your daughter. And we heard earlier, uh, I don't remember from whom, about how, I think it was from Sheila, how much the young girls who migrate uh, suffer sexual violence, abuse, etc., on the road until they reach safely somewhere where they have to survive. So all of these uh, factors really make this uh, this, uh, this summit even more important because it's far more complex than just hitting in one area where you're residing. It is something that is uh, affecting much wider and much more, uh, as I said, the, the vulnerability, the intersectionality, but also the globality. Nobody, no society is free from that impact. 
It will vary, of course. We said uh, this morning again, it was said by Daniel, I think, that if you're wealthy and you have the means, you would live it differently. It was also said, I think, by Astrid, some of people have boats, some don't even have a boat. So, and some of them may have a, a luxury boat. So all of these factors come together and have to explain to us why these groups are more affected. I would not like to use the word more vulnerable because as I said, they are not vulnerable intrinsically. They become vulnerable because of the lack of access to resources, to wealth, to the power of decision making. And migrants are completely without any of this power. They are completely helpless. Um, Selena, can I just get your take on, on this with regards to what has been happening in Marshall Islands and, and others like Marshall Islands, it, where for a number of years now we've been hearing the discussion of trying to um, figure out another area in the region to relocate people because we know that islands are projected to um, be beneath water um, a lot sooner than later, uh, which is startling in itself. Um, tell us a little more about the conversations that you've been hearing and the climate gatherings that you've been attending and, um, and just how serious um, the delegations, for example, from the biggest polluters um, have been taking this. Because remember, um, it's uh, many of these countries that are most economically vulnerable that have to depend on uh, these wealthier nations that, or other nations that happen to be the biggest polluters and have and face less of a risk when it comes to uh, adapting to climate change. Well, one thing is for sure, all the big polluter countries, they, these are often the most developed in all the, in the colonial countries, they do not want to take the responsibility. And my people, um, yes, there has been discussions of relocation, and this has already happened in some of our neighboring countries. So um, that includes Kiribati. They've also um, found a place in uh, bought lands in Fiji where they've relocated some of their people into. And we also have a group of um, people from Gale who have been relocated because of the, um, during the nuclear testing and they were, they were promised to, brought, to be brought back to their island, but that hasn't happened because those islands are still contaminated. And so they've uh, bought a piece of land in Hawaii. Um, and so people are, people are relocating and more and more the reasons they're, um, they're, they're moving to places is because of um, the climate crisis. But, be, but mostly it has also been for education, for, um, for health reasons. And one of the long-term um, solutions, those, those a couple of the long-term solutions that the Marshall Island is, is really pushing for is, um, is re reclaiming and raising the islands and expanding them. And so this means that, um, and I, I'm putting this out here, that this, doesn't, this means we are not accepting having to relocate permanently from our country because it is where it is and that's where we deserve to be. And And so reclaiming and raising and expanding the islands would then mean having to internally relocate the people from these islands that, uh, because we're trying to um, build man-made lands in uh, the ocean where the water is shallow enough, um, that means um, moving people from the, from the uh, coastal areas where they're most impacted so that they can then um, make landfills over there to potentially create new lands. Um, so it's a very, very big, um, huge um, endeavor to take on, and that's why the funding from um, to, towards loss and damage um, from the for climate uh, crisis impacted communities needs to come in because this requires a lot and a lot of money and a lot of resource and a lot of um, a lot of technicalities and and the 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 power to do so that we currently don't have in the Marshall Islands. And that means people who are, who, are, um, who are professionals in this field of, okay, how can we raise this land? What are the procedures to go to? And so this is, th these are things that we're not very well versed on, but we're constantly working with experts in these fields to, um, to see how further we can go. But this is for the long-term plan. And while we're trying to adapt to that, um, we're looking into smaller, um, smaller uh, actions like building seawalls. So these are for the short-term plan, but definitely that 
long-term adaptation plan is where we are currently for the Marshall Islands. Phil Flavia, did you want to uh, say something to that? Yeah, well, this draws me back to my story because growing up, I grew up in a village and when our farm was devastated, my father had to move to the town to get another job. And after some years, we also had to follow because the conditions in the village weren't favorable for us. And I see it in many families in Uganda where people have to move internally, where people are displaced by uh, the, the, the climate change disasters. Recently, I think one month ago, we had landslides in one of the areas uh, that was because of the heavy rains. Uh, about 20 people were killed and many lost their lives, their property. Many girls' education was disconnected, discontinued. Up to now, they haven't yet gotten back to school. Many families had to look for new places where to stay. And this is not the first time it's happening. It has been happening for years. So this is a very big issue that we cannot look on. And I feel like we have a lot of pretense right now going on, uh, given the fact that we know that climate change is a very big challenge to humanity right now. We know what needs to be done, but we always look up to other people to be the ones bearing the responsibility. I feel like everyone in this room knows what is happening, what needs to be done. For example, uh, CU Boulder has uh, scientific research that shows that climate change is a very big challenge. But there is still investment in fossil fuels. So I feel like we are not who we really are. There is a lot of pretense going on. And Thank you. This is the shift that uh, we have all been talking about. We need a paradigm shift. We need a real shift from what is really going on to what really needs to be done. I want to pursue that further. But first, I wanted to bring in, and if it's all right with everyone, um, a question from the audience. That was, um, if you want to submit questions, you can do so through the app, by the way. Um, this person asks uh, the panel if they can to talk about how girls' access to quality climate education, how that would change our collective ability to respond to climate change. Nahala, you want to take that first? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Girls' education, in short, can do a lot, whether it is focused on climate change or just educating our girls. Because the problem starts with the dropout of school, with what I illustrated earlier, that when there is a need for uh, uh, fetching water or fetching wood, it's always the girl that we take out of school and ask her to do this and that. And so they are not equipped. So that leads to child marriage. So that leads to uh, early pregnancy. So that leads to all what you can imagine beyond that. So educating girls in, in itself is empowering them, is bringing them to the table to express themselves. And these young ladies here are girls who just came up from uh, and have been empowered to do what they're doing. And I admire them. And I want to really salute their courage and commitment. And, um, but uh, adding the dimension of understanding the phenomena and understanding, as Flavia said, that each one of us has a role to play. And we can start. And we can't simply say, because it's too complex, I push it back tomorrow, and I will do something else later on. That uh, if we can, if they understand better the impact of every behavior on the uh, planet, then we will mitigate. It will start to be the adaptation. That the use and abuse of resources. Let's look now at the crisis that happened with the war in Ukraine. All of a sudden, because energy became an issue, everyone start to understand that they have to use the, bu the right bulb and that they have to watch this. But we don't need to reach the stage of war to understand that we need to manage better the resources that we have. So definitely educating girls in this field, uh, it's also because they have a more responsibility as women are 
to always taking all the caring role. They will be able to manage their household more constructively. They will be able also to protect their own mobility. Do you know that, that the victims during the tsunami of 2016 were more women? Not because they didn't know how to run, because they couldn't run and leave the babies and the elderly they were caring for. So how do we address the caring function of women? Should it be always 80%, if not 100% by women? So all of these questions will help us address really with a very strong commitment and changing our attitude and behavior and being much more you know, inclusive in the process of deciding on the strategies forward, we can affect the change. And this is an illustration today, the two ladies. Hilda Flavia and Selena, you have certainly been a, a strong forces in change in Uganda and the Marshall Islands and taking that message around the globe. I'm curious, at home, have you received pushback or significant pushback um, during, in the course of, of your work? Um, Hilda Flavia, why don't you take that? Have you received a pushback at home? Yeah, I do. I just wanted to shortly comment on girls' education because I'm a victim of climate change. And despite this hardship, I did eventually have the good fortune to go to school when my dad uh, got a job in construction. And I am really grateful because most girls who are kicked out of school by the effects of climate change don't get uh, the opportunity to go back to school. And we have seen that numbers are increasing for many girls who have dropped out of school because of climate change. And my education gave me the knowledge and confidence to start uh, a young youth organization. So if it wasn't my education, where would I be? My education wasn't that so good, but I'm able to sit here and speak to people about climate change. I got this information on the internet. Imagine if I was taught by a professor, where would I be? So I strongly believe that girls' education can create a difference that we so badly need in this world. And to go back to your question about um, the pushback the pushback yeah. so i work with youth and just to share a story recently in september we had this uh, march or protest against the east african crude oil pipeline that is being constructed in my village by total energies which is a french company a group of us went for a strike and we were presenting a letter to the european union parliament asking them to advise Total to stop the construction of this pipeline because it's devastating our lands and uh, many people have been kicked away from their land and they don't have anywhere to go. So we were, some of us were arrested by police. So nine of us were detained and we spent, uh, they spent a lot of time in these prisons. We made noise online and we tried to reach out to different people to see that uh, our fellow activists are, uh, are gotten out of prison, but this took a while. I also share from a personal perspective, I've been arrested several times due to speaking up against uh, climate change, due to demanding for climate action from governments, from uh, uh, big institutions from uh, industries or companies like Total Energies. But did you and sense that you were being treated differently from your male counterparts who were also involved in uh, climate justice, climate action? Yeah, that distinction is there. And um, if you are a girl, you are treated as if you, you don't know what you're talking about, as if you don't have information or knowledge about what you are doing. So. What happened to me is when I was detained in these prison cells, they kept asking me, who has sent you to do this? Why are you doing this? They kept asking me, who is giving me money to speak about climate change? And it really hurt me, this question, to be coming from the same people who are facing the same climate effects we face, but are in position to create a difference, but they don't even know that they hold that power. And I kept telling them, we are climate activists. We speak for the truth. We speak for our environment. We are not politicians who are being paid. And it kept 
it kept on you know ringing in my head how someone could think of such a thing and this is what goes on on a daily basis they always ask us because everything is so politicized mm. selena what what has been your experience at home i'm curious i think not enough people i think really hear the stories of what happens on the front lines especially to women and girls and that even though you will have women and men in the same movement the treatment is different tell me about your experience well because i started this when i was 15 um so it was my age my gender and that was the barrier towards my elders. And so I would receive comments um, from my elders and from our political leaders and our teachers and say, oh, whose daughter is this? Did the parents not teach her? Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of them came towards my family and not towards the action I was done. And one of the teachers had pulled me aside and then she was kind of so, sort of similar. So Hilda, and she asked me, oh, all the teachers are talking about the stuff that you're doing and they're saying that, oh, someone must have written the stuff that she wrote and then had her posted in her name. Um, and so despite coming from a matrilineal society, so that means land and power is passed through the woman, um, because of colonialism and Christianity, that has shifted a lot of the way that our culture works, so it's become more patriarch. Um, and that has created a lot of barriers towards um, young climate, young women who are climate activists like myself. And the things that I had looked to to empower me were the proverbs that my grandparents would um, teach to me. And so we have two that I wanted to share today: Lejman Juri and Lumaro Koloyo. And so both of them means Lejman Juri is a woman, um, basically tells of a woman in our, his, in our traditional times that whenever there was war or conflict between family, it was the woman who would step forward and make peace. And she'd just say, oh, let's make peace and peace would be done, would be made. And because it was that, that was the amount of power that she had and the influence she had in the society. El Lumaro Bibir Coloyo is the opposite in which when there would be conflict, it was the woman who would come forth and give courage and empower the men who would be off to fight in the war. And so when I was reading these proverbs that my grandparents were teaching me and hearing them, it was the exact opposite of how I was seeing the women in my society in today's time were acting and being treated. And so um, it was channeling and reaching back to our traditional wisdoms that have enabled and helped me continue in this fight. Thank you. That was an important, thank you. That's gonna stay with me. Okay, let me bring in another question. COP27, you knew it had to come up today. <laughs> what is your assessment, this is similar as well, what is your assessment of COP27 recently held in Egypt in addressing disparities between nations such as the United States, where this conference is being held, whose development and wealth were built on the use of fossil fuels, and less developed countries also working to improve their infrastructures and grow their economies, but face existential threats from climate change. And I'm thinking about the mixed reactions to the historic uh, agreement on loss and damage. So Matthias, if you will, could you, uh, Briefly, give us your assessment on loss and damage and maybe one other thing that really stood out of COP27 to you. I don't hear you, Matthias. Uh, I was about to say, I, I, I wasn't at COP27 and I followed it, of course, but uh, as I did with previous COPs, but my, ex I mean, my uh, thinking of, these COPs and this meeting, including the one that just took place, is on a broader level. I, it seems to me that there will be no uh, political solution to this crisis, at least not one that will be found at this COP format. I'm, I'm quite pessimistic about that. I, mean, uh, I think there is, should there be progress here, tangible progress and enough progress, I think uh, 
some other format has to be tested. I think that this uh, this one has proven that it, it is not working. I'm, uh, uh, I, uh, it's kind of a more of a general assessment of, of, of the whole structure where, the, where these talks take place than, uh, than going into details and what was done there and what was not that, uh, done at that particular meeting and so on. I think the, the problem is that uh, in uh, in these negotiations or discussions, uh, being incapable has kind of become an enthusiasm for being unwilling. There, there is no enough political will to to do anything about this. And I think an additional problem of this is that this climate change crisis has has peaked, or uh, well, it hasn't even peaked, but re reached a critical status at the same time as we have now. Uh, 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 sen sentiment, what we call it, in the world, where people do not, it's kind of okay to not trust authorities and not trust experts, be they scientists or be they politicians, and, 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 and act accordingly. And um, uh, but what I, about, I, what I about don't... your take on loss and damage, for example? I mean, we've, that made headlines, right? The immediate aftermath of, of, of the, the, the uh, of, uh, final gathering made headlines around the world. Historic agreement, loss and damage, finally. And yet, we kept hearing then the assessments 24 hours later, maybe even less, that um, if you didn't have the ambitions, accountability ambitions on, that would call for fossil fuel uh, uh, emissions reduction, if you don't have stronger measures there, that would undercut loss and damage. And then we were back to the back and forth about whether COP27, that aspect especially, was effective at all. And uh, so, I, I mean, Matthias, you, if you're, you're welcome to speak on that if you feel comfortable or we can throw it to Nahala. What, 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 was, what, what did you think when you saw the headlines about that historic agreement? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there, I mean, this issue has to be dealt with, but again, I think it is also, uh, that is not this part of the broader picture that I, I talked to. I mean, if there cannot be damages, compensation to those that are suffering and have suffered from past practices and are now seeing even more of that, if that cannot be compensated by those that are rich and are caused most of these problems, I cannot see that there will be, um, any movement or at least tangible and, and enough movement forward in this why uh, i mean why would you act as as a poor participant if those that are rich and have the greatest possibilities to act are not uh, willing and do they part it, it's quite natural then that the uh, the reaction to those that are less capable or less in a position to to act that they they don't feel obligated to take those measures that are needed when those are in a better position to take those that are not. I think that's it's only natural. No, and, no. But they, and still, we don't we don't see that action as those two have said before. Uh, Nahla, your thoughts on that? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I think we all agree that the, the the multilateral system is not perfect, but it's necessary. It's the only avenue where countries speak to each other, and where we were able with the civil society push until we reach the Paris Agreement to get at least what we got, even if it's not perfect. So we have to maintain, even if we COP is not convincing, it has been retaken by industrial world. There is the, the tension is there between our demand and what they want to, to safeguard for their, for their uh, own interest. This is the way the world is. It's a reflection of the world. But we need this forum because we can still push the agenda further and this loss and damage even if now it's just you know income paper it's what we are going to be able to make out of it in the next round in the negotiation in knocking at the door in being at the table and i think many people in this room have been so much involved in what we have reached now including recently as was alluded to again this morning the general assembly resolution 
that considers the right to a healthy environment as a human right is a big thing. It had not one single vote against it. You tell me General Assembly resolution are not necessarily implemented. Yes, but these are a framework. We can use that. We can continue to further. So this is our advocacy role, and we have to include more and more the, uh, the activists on the environmental side. Many of them, as we also learned today, uh, are assassinated or silenced or harassed in many different ways. And we heard already today from two activists also what they face. So we have to continue the work of advocating and linking up those who can make a difference to obtain more. We have to be at the table. We have to influence the negotiation. Remember what Sheila said earlier? No, uh, not, no to, to, um, to protest. Uh, don't go to protest, go to influence. Mm. So I w I'm from that school of thought. It's, uh, and I think after all my years in the multilateral system, it's through influence that we have what we have today, which is much better than what we had 10, 20 years ago, where there was no framework at all. It's far from being perfect because it's a reflection of our world, which is far from being perfect. But I think now we're reaching that, well, we're already there, that sense of desperation about our collective ability to actually um, limit warming um, below two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. And the, the, the climate targets are fast approaching. I mean, of course, we've been seeing, especially in the natural disasters that have occurred just this past year alone, all of the, the, the devastating um, cyclones, hurricanes, the devastating floods, and, and it, all of this has actually, has actually amplified um, the discussions about whether there is this political will. I mean, for goodness sakes, I mean, everyone, as you were saying, everyone's affected but these are the forms that were supposed to assist significantly in bringing the collective together at the table to decide once and for all, this is what we need to do to save our planet. And yet the political will is persistently absent. Um, as we head into the, la the final minutes of, of this discussion, of this forum, we're gonna talk about solutions because we don't wanna leave here with the things that are the challenges without leaving us with something that we can do individually and as a collective. Um, let's talk a little bit about what it might take to influence, to turn the tide of political will. Um, it, let me begin with Nahala because she has been in the <laughs> trenches on the policy level especially. I think that we have to be, um, as creative as we can to, to be able to show the politicians who are lacking political will what's in it for them. If we can't bring from the science, from the what's in it for them to have them more committed and give us really the sense that there is a political will, uh, we will not necessarily be able to move. It's nothing about just naming and shaming will not help us continuously. We know where the problem is, but we have to show them that there's something in it for them. And I can't propose something concrete, but this is the, the, the thinking that I have in mind when, when I will be dialoguing with state parties within CEDAW. I will have to bring something to, un, to make them understand that including women, that uh, uh, you know, uh, more uh, uh, empowerment of women in this sphere in particular will yield positive results. If I don't manage to do that, they would not be interested in a charity type of action. This is unfortunately my experience from dialoguing with member states. So let's collectively think about how we can sell this to our politician to obtain their political will. Thank you. Um, uh, Selena, do you think what you've been doing are you confident that what you've been doing um, is, is going to work uh, well enough to actually finally pressure uh, the biggest polluters, for example, to do what they need to do to limit, um, help limit the global temperature rise below two degrees Celsius because the track is that it ain't gonna happen. Mm -hmm. But you and Hilda Flavia and so many others 
um, in, involved in youth-led movements have been out there every day, every week, every month, every year. Um, how confident are you that doing what you're doing now could turn the tide or might turn the tide? Or are you having second thoughts about just how effective it's been? I used to have second thoughts, but then I was thinking, whose perspective and narrative is having me, is having me have these second thoughts? And I realized it's all these data from science, um, from scientists, um, and from what the big countries are saying. And I thought, oh, if I listen to them, I'm giving them even more power to write my people's history. And that's not what I want to do. And I'm looking at the amount of time that we still have and the amount of effort that my people is putting on the ground to do systematic change. And that is what I'm letting guide me. And also while I was um, thinking about, oh, these are the frameworks that we have to work with and such, I kept think, I just thought of um, toxic relationships. <laughs> the standard that we have, I feel that needs to change. Because if you've been systematically oppressed for so long, if you've been abused and gaslighted for so long, whatever amount of win is so profound to you, and you feel like it's something that will make change. And from therapy, <laughs> thank goodness for therapy, <laughs> I've learned that you can take that back and learn to write your own story and learn to um, shut off these, um, these, these um, oppressions that have been, that you've been conditioned in and that you can raise your standard yourself, and that's what I think we need to do. We need to set the standards of very high people. <laughs> yeah. Hilda Flavia, your thoughts on this? Yeah. Thank you. So I think we first need to understand why we are in this place. We have systems. They have brought to this challenge of climate change. It's a systematic change. And the same systems that brought about the challenge we are facing today cannot be the same systems that will uh, put us out of this challenge. And something that I have been thinking that we are, are not taking seriously or we are not thinking about is the power of the people. There is so much power in us that we don't even realize. We are the same people who put the people that are in power. It's our votes that make them powerful. It's us who give them the power that they so much have. And I feel like if the power of the people is put together, if we come together, work together, we can create a system that will lead to the change that we so badly need. For many generations, uh, we've seen that challenges such as apartheid, such as slave trade, all these wars weren't won because there was political will. They were won because the power of the people was active. The people stood up to their rights. And I think that this is the time in history where humanity has to come to that certain level of understanding that we own the power that will create the world. For so long, we have been looking up to political will. Where has that led us? We are still begging for them to create the change we need. And yet, we can be able to bring about that change that we so badly demand from political will. So I think this is the time when we have to stand up, hold each other's hands, and create the difference that we so badly need, because we will not get the change from political will. Okay. In the last few minutes that we have, please let's talk about solutions, please. Governments worldwide have undertaken various initiatives intended to address mitigation, adaptation, sustainability concerns. Um, we hear about 
For example, we were talking about beliefs at the start of this, carbon credits. Yeah. Now, they're described as solutions designed to address inequality gaps. But many critics argue that some proposals are not solutions at all for the communities on the front lines of climate change that have endured historic inequalities rooted in former colonial rule and ongoing exploitation. Nahala, um, tell us about those solutions that are so prevalent out there, um, especially, I mean, under the Biden administration has been very vocal about its commitment uh, to, uh, to climate action. Um, the U.S. is not alone. Many of its allies and many other countries have done the same thing. But there's a message that's getting lost in all of this when we're talking about solutions. Tell, me, tell us more about that. I think the... Um one of the most important uh, sphere of work is the private sector. It's corporate responsibility. It's all the uh, uh, industry, extractive industry, and all fracking, and all what is happening that needs to be much more in the solution. They are the perpetrator of uh, these uh, damages. And they are getting away, continue to get away with murder in a way. And they have extraterritorial also, um, you know, uh, obligation that they are not respecting. So we are not addressing them enough. We're focusing only government, government, and government is always shy because private sector is a big investor in government money. So this, we have to break a little bit the cycle to get them more uh, uh, concerned about paying for the harm, about repairing some of the harm, and about really taking mitigation to heart within their own uh, uh, industry. And there is a way. When there is a will, there is a way. So I think this, this is a sphere where we need to, really need to look at, at a possible solution with those partners, and not simply you know, um, yeah, shy away from them, because they, they are the most responsible for those emissions. All right, and since um, we're talking about solutions and we're running short of time, let's talk about if we have a long list of solutions, but you only get one today. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you only get one today. Um, Selena, what would you ask for? Representation from all those in the frontline communities. Yes. Okay. Hilda Flavia, what would you ask for? <laughs> That's a big question. You want me to come back to you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, okay. I know what to ask for, but okay. to get one. Yeah. OK. Um, I also would say uh, what Selena has said, representation, because we've seen this at many occasions. For example, at COP27, they told us it's an African COP happening in COP, so African uh, have to be prioritized. But we are only there for the pictures to show that there's a percentage. and. Representation is something that is greatly needed, yeah. Matthias, very briefly, if you could have one out of the long list of solutions, what would that one solution be today? Yeah, I think yeah, the power to make decisions here have to be shifted from those that might have the means to those that are mostly affected by the, uh, the effects of climate change. And Nahala, you get the last word on this one. I would say definitely representation, but proactive, no window dressing, as was said, and empowering those to speak up for themselves, empowering those voices. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, all of you. We are just about out of time, but we could go on and on and on on these discussions, and we'll all have an opportunity to do that. Uh, in the remainder of the conference as well. There are going to be some amazing panels where we will uh, revisit many of these themes and hear some really uh, personal, very powerful stories. Before I let you go, I just wanted to say a thank you to um, our panelists here and a thank you to Dr. Emily Ye for her guidance and assisting with this panel. Uh, she's a professor here and so very grateful and to the entire team and to all of you uh, for contributing questions and, uh, and being such an active voice and active presence in all of this. So sincere thanks to all of you. And have a great conference, everyone. Enjoy. Thank you. Lexi.